A PID controller stands for Proportional Integral and Derivative Controller. Its schematic is here. The general logic is that the plant produces some kind of output as a function of time, then you have a reference output as a function of time, then the reference minus the real output will give you an error as a function of time, which enters the PID controller, and then you get a control input, UT, that goes into the plant. And the way the input is calculated is with this formula here. As you can see, it has three terms. This is proportional, this is integral, and this is derivative. So once you have your error, you also have to integrate that error over time, from 0 till t. Integration means continuous summation, so you always add new errors to the previous ones in order to get the history of your error from time equals 0 seconds till your present time. And then you also have to take the time derivative of your error for the third term. The purpose of this term is to kill the error. The problem with that is that while it always takes you to your reference, once you reach your reference point, your velocity is not zero there, and so you will overshoot. And then once you return to your reference point, you will overshoot in another direction. To deal with that, you have the derivative term. It kills the overshoot. So now, your response might be something like this. The derivative term acts as an artificial damper. Now, if I divide my response in these sections, then my error will be positive here because my yr is greater than my real y for as long as you haven't reached this dashed purple line yet. However, your error dot is negative because as you approach your reference value, your error is decreasing. It's getting smaller. So its time derivative has to be negative. Then in this section, your error is negative because your y is bigger than your yr and your error dot is negative because in this section, your negative error is getting more negative. Then in this section, your error is still negative, but this negative error is becoming less negative, so error dot is positive. And then in this section, your error is positive, and your error dot is positive, because it's getting more positive. Since your yr is constant, you can simply make error dot equal to minus y dot. So it has the opposite sign to the y's time derivative. Before the yellow dashed line, the output's time derivative is positive, and after the yellow line, it's negative, and your error dot is the opposite of that. And so, if I assign some values to the kp and kd constants, and those values are both positive, then notice the effect. In the first section, the proportional term produces a positive result, and the derivative term produces a negative result, which makes your control input smaller. So we can assume that it's some kind of applied force. So because of this derivative term, this applied force is smaller. And so as you approach the reference line, you apply less control force, and that slows you down as you get closer to your reference value, which is exactly what you want. In the second section, both terms will be negative, assuming that both of these constants are positive. Again, this is exactly what you want, because you're overshooting, and so you need a stronger control force in the opposite direction. And that stronger control force is possible because both of the terms 
have the same sign. So that was for the first section, that was for the second section. Then in the third section, you have a negative term here and a positive term here. Again, this is what you want because as you approach your reference line, the proportional part gives you a negative force that pushes you towards your reference value. However, as you approach it, you want to reduce your speed. And you do that by reducing your control force. And that control force is reduced by the positive derivative term. And finally, in the fourth section, which is this one, both terms are positive, which is again what you want, because as you're getting further and further away from your reference value, you want to make sure that you have a strong control force in the positive direction to slow down your departure. As you can see, this is the way how the derivative term helps you kill the overshoot. But there is one more problem. You might get stable not at your reference value, but a little bit below or above it. Let's assume that we become stable below it. We call it the steady state error. The proportional and the derivative terms are not able to get rid of it. For example, you might have a rocket and let's say that you want its tip to reach this reference line. So this is your error. You have a gravity force applied to it. It controls its altitude with thrust. So imagine that the rocket finally reaches the desired location where the tip matches the altitude. But once that happens, your error will be zero. And let's say that it stays zero because your derivative term has also managed to make the velocity zero there. Since the rocket's velocity at that level is zero, your error dot will be zero. But now, if your control input is the thrust, and you only have the proportional and the derivative term, and your error and error dot are zeros, then your thrust will be zero. But when that happens, the gravity force will pull the rocket down. Gravity is not going to disappear anywhere. And then, once the rocket goes down, again you have an error, you turn on your thrust, and so eventually, what will happen is that the rocket will become stable, but only when the thrust force and the gravity force cancel each other out. Then the rocket will be in equilibrium. And when that happens, your error dot will be zero, of course, because your error won't be changing, so the derivative term will be zero, but your error cannot be zero because you need thrust in order to counter mg. And the only way you can have thrust is to have some error in the equation. Remember, we are assuming that we don't have this integral term yet. We only have the proportional and the derivative term. So you must have some error in order to produce the necessary amount of thrust to counter mg. And that's when you get your steady state error. In order to get rid of that steady state error, you need this third term, the integral term, because this term can have a value even when the error and error dot are zeros. Because this integral not only gives you the current error, but the entire history of your errors from the start of your simulation or your event in general. So when you include this integral term, then for as long as you have error, then the integral of error that you integrate over time constantly changes. So if your error is always positive, the integral gets bigger and bigger. And so if ki is also positive, 
then this middle term, the integral term, will also be positive, giving you more thrust that overcomes the gravity force and it will take the nose closer to the reference line. And now you can stabilize your rocket at YR. So let's say that you have managed to do that. You have managed to stabilize the rocket here. The nose is touching it. So the error is zero. And let's say that you have managed to make its velocity zero as well at the required level. So your E dot is zero. In that case, this term becomes zero and this term becomes zero. But you will still have thrust, which will come from this middle term because it also accounts for the past errors. And now since your error and error dot are zeros, the integral of your error over time will be constant. It cannot change any longer because your error is zero. But the integral itself is not zero. It's just a constant value, which when multiplied by ki gives you a constant thrust value that balances the rocket at the right level by cancelling out the gravity force. So that's the intuition. So the goal of the middle term is to kill the steady state error. And now these three constants that you have, by choosing values for them, you essentially decide how much weight you give to killing the error versus how much weight you give to killing the overshoot versus how much weight you give to killing the steady state error. All these constants should be positive, but now the art is to find the right positive values for these three constants. Looking for the right numbers for them is called PID tuning, and there are different methods to do it. Since we are going to be working with a linear system, we can represent everything here in Laplace as well. And the control input can also be represented in Laplace, as you can see it here. And so, when you're working with a linear system, you can use pole placement for tuning your PID controller. By choosing the desired poles in the S-plane, you can figure out which values are the correct ones for these three constants so that the system would obtain the desired closed loop poles. And this is what we will be doing in this section. Thank you.